I think that in order for people to appreciate the M48 Yugoslavian Mauser, we really ought to look and think about the people who lived in the Balkans. During World War II, the Axis partners in the occupation of Yugoslavia were Germans, Italians, Hungarians, and Bulgarians. They partitioned Yugoslavia into zones and held them under military occupation. That means they had to go through military checkpoints regularly. It meant that family and friends would disappear and then never be seen again having the wealth extracted from your country, slavery to their system, and proceed to work you to death with little or no compensation, total loss of freedom, combined with mass executions of civilians. If someone gave you the opportunity to fight back, would you do it? You would eventually hear stories of Yugoslavian partisans shooting up a German checkpoint, stealing their munitions, and lighting a fire to their establishment, all professionally executed and well-led. They gave the people hope, and as a result, the number of part partisans swelled. The Yugoslavian partisans eventually became expert insurgents and really made it tough for their Axis occupiers, and they drew badly needed resources away from the German invasion of Russia. Tito knew all too well how totalitarian regimes did business. And the Yugoslavs were done with it. No more. After World War II, under Tito's leadership, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia rejected Stalin and would not sign the Warsaw Pact Agreement, which was a Soviet alliance. That meant that if Yugoslavia was going to survive, they required a large, well-trained, well-equipped standing army, Air Force and Navy. Tito also needed to be able to manufacture his own munitions and weapons. Yugoslav forces were using a hodgepodge of various rifle designs and ammunition and various calibers after the war. He needed to standardize the weapons and munitions of the military and began to cultivate a national Yugoslavian identity for Serbs, Croats, Montenegrins, Macedonians, and Muslims. Tito famously said, Here and during our entire struggle, no one questioned who was a Serb, who was a Croat, who was a Montenegrin, who was a Macedonian, and who was a Muslim. We are all one. That means we were all fighters. Fighters for the freedom of our country, the whole of Yugoslavia. So essentially, our diversity does not make us strong. Our unity does. And if we are able to survive, we will need one another. Question is, how would they do this? In 1925, the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes made an agreement with Belgium for 100,000 Model 24 Mausers, 110 million rounds of ammunition, and one of their manufacturing lines from the F Fabric National Plant. FN would train Yugoslav workers between 1925 to 1927 and essentially duplicate an entire production line in Yugoslavia. The new factory would be built at Kragujevic, the first production of M24 rifles rolled off the floor in December 1927. By the time World War II started, Yugoslavia's Mauser production had provided the army with 1 million Model 24 intermediate length Mauser rifles. When the Germans invaded and occupied Yugoslavia, they found 250,000 M24 rifles in long term storage. There were two factories manufacturing firearms and components at that time one at Uzis and one at Kragujevic. The Germans closed the Uzis factory and assigned a security detail to guard it. Later, Yugoslavian partisans would sneak into the factory and take a basic inventory of what was inside. Thousands of new barrels, parts and components collecting dust. A complete factory being neglected by occupying Axis forces. 
The factory at Kragievik, also known as the Military Technical Institute, was primarily used as a machine gun workshop during the war by the Germans. That also did repairs to most types of Axis weapons. After the factory was repatriated by the Yugoslavian partisans, they quickly went to work repairing and assembling captured German weapons using a wide assortment of parts. These rifles were marked with the new Yugoslav rule mark on the receivers. Between 1941 to 1945, around 1 million Yugoslavian people perished, with possibly 300,000 of them from Bosnia and Herzegovina alone. A huge trauma for the people, mental scar, abused people. As if the Axis occupiers weren't bad enough, Yugoslavians also contended with Croatian Ustazi, also fascists, genocidal campaigns against Serbs, Jews, Gypsies, communists, and political opponents. There were nationalist or royal Serb Chetniks, and there were, there were moments during the war when they were very cozy with the Axis powers. And then you had the communist partisans, which, which had limited Allied support. They fought the Nazis, Croatian fascists, sometimes the Chetniks. After the war, under the leadership of Marshal Tito, ethnic Germans, Croatian, Croatian Ustase, Chetniks, and tens of thousands of political opponents were imprisoned or executed. It was a brutal cru and, and crushing cleansing of the political and military opposition that occurred within the first year after the conclusion of World War II. The country would become a one-party socialist state with an all-powerful secret service kind of modeled after the Soviet NKVD, they had a large police force and a large military force and industrial complex. Tito knew that the new Yugoslav Federation would suffer from national issues from fascists, royalists, nationalists, counter-revolutionaries, and collaborators, but he was quickly to crush dissent. And that's what repre repressive regimes sometimes do. If Yugoslavia was to survive, then Tito would have to be brutal. Yet Tito was beloved by many and continues to be to this day. By 1948, the Yugoslavians had assembled 10,935 new M2447s, which is a refurbed M24, and they had also um, rebuilt 53,776 K98Ks of German manufacture, but rebuilt to Yugoslavian standards, which is a pretty impressive accomplishment so soon after the war. As the factory began to, began to run out of parts and materials, a new approach was required, standardization, modernization. In the 1950s, factory workers were tasked with building a prototype rifle that had the most streamlined and efficient manufacturing requirements. They built a prototype that was built on the M24 Intermediate Mauser Action with some German K98K features, such as the turn down bolt and sling attachments. A total of, in the first three years of production between 1950 and 1952, 239,000 M48 rifles were manufactured. The early rifles were a bit rough as workers were fairly new and inexperienced. Future variants, the M48A, the M48B, um, would have some stamp parts rather than milled parts. Manufacturing efficiencies were made, but were generally of a higher quality than the first line of M48 rifles. The military council was so impressed with the M48 that they ceased reliance on refurbishing the M24-47, the K98K, and the VZ24-52 models in 1956, and were put into storage if they had been removed from the scale of issue. By 1957, M48 manufacturing essentially ceased, due to the, you know, the SKS and the AK variants, which, which they started to manufacture as well. Having made 1,166,000 M48 model rifles and variants, they ceased production. Channel. Today we're going to be taking a couple of Yugoslavian Mausers out for a spin, namely the K90AK that you see here. This is, uh, is, a, is a German captured rifle that was remanufactured by the Yugoslavians and put into, uh, put into their supply system. And secondly, we're going to be comparing that with the, um, the Yugoslavian M48, as you see here. Uh, both chambered in 8x57 Mauser, and uh, we're going to be conducting a, just a 10-round relay today with, with each rifle, five rounds 
and the prone supported without bayonet and then another five rounds with bayonet attached. Uh, just to see what kind of the variation and point of impact might be, what our average group size is with each, and just just for uh, just for interest sakes, I'm I'm curious to see what the results are, and uh, I think maybe it'll be a video that you guys enjoy as well. Today I'll, I am uh, attired in the garb that you may have seen uh, um, a Tito era Yugoslavian uh, soldier, uh, the kind of kit that that soldier may have, may have adorned, uh, uh, just just to make the video a little bit more interesting and kind of period dress is cool too I mean it's it's a hot day it's 32 degrees Celsius and there's almost no no wind and it is hot this hat is wool the pants are wool and uh, I'm kind of regretting them that I'm wearing it right now <laughs> then we joke here here's the video hope you enjoy it okay so five rounds without a bayonet five rounds with a bayonet same target camera is fixed on the target so you'll be able to see where the impacts are uh, where the strikes are impacting and uh, total 10 rounds interesting relay what is the variation and point of impact going to be range or distance is 100 meters rifle is hot very hot it's over 30 degrees Celsius and I'm wearing wool pants <laughs> All right. Come on, you gotta have a little bit of fun out here. Woo, she's hot. Hot, hot, hot. <clears throat> yeah, this would be interesting. I'm curious to see what the difference is gonna be at 100 meters. If any, The ergonomics of the M48 are definitely different. Oh, I'm gonna raise the sight here. Okay. Actually, no, 
Jones. You ready? Bex! Bayonet! Come on. <clears throat> okay. That's twice in a row now. It's not feed as well. Here's stripper clubs. That's interesting. All right. Let's go, Mr. Target. Okay, here is the uh, the M48. Now I've uh, I've drawn on the targets, so you can kind of see where we're coming from. But you can see these aren't great groups. The ammunition that we're shooting, by the way, is PPU 198 great grain uh, full metal jacket bow tail. It does not is not good quality ammunition. It is sure okay. It's made in Serbia. These are essentially Yugoslavian rifles, Yugoslavian ammunition. Just trying to keep it as Yugoslavian as I can. <laughs> Even the garb, but uh, yeah, the M48 didn't really uh, enjoy shooting that particular ammunition. I know that the rifle can shoot because I've shot my hand loads, 195 grain Hornady uh, Spitzer points and 179 grain uh, full metal jacket 
uh, boat tails, and they are also cupro uh, plated, cupro nickel plated bullets. They shoot great. They're, they've been pulled from other calibers and used in here, but it does not like the PPU. So if I take the best out of five, the best four out of five rounds, we have a, basically a three inch group here and a three inch group here. This here is uh, without the bayonet. This here is with the bayonet. So interesting, so it's about one, two, three, four, five and a half inch variation between the two, 100 meters, which is huge. But it's interesting to see over here with the K98, AKA Tito is the name of that rifle, that how we were able to manage like a one inch group here, best four out of five. And here we're, we're looking at about a two inch group with the bayonet on, so I mean, and there's, there's, all, there's about two, two and a half inches of variation between bayonet on and bayonet off. Five and a half, bayonet on, bayonet off. So if you're gonna go into a battle, <laughs> which rifle would you like to carry? The M48 or the K, K, K98K? I think, I think if we're using this as our, as our model, you're probably gonna leave the M48 at home. I will say, okay, so at the M here's what I'll say about the M48. I actually, uh, I kind of prefer the species of the stock, uh, from laminated to um, common elm. Uh, lots of the M48s were, were manufactured with, with elm wood, this, which is what this is. And uh, this one here has been treated with linseed oil many years ago, and I continue to treat it with linseed oil. And has darkened quite substantially since I pulled this one out of grease. And well, I'll let you look for yourselves. It's quite, it's quite beautiful actually. The stock is quite beautiful. Um, the uh, the handguard is retaining a lot of heat from the rifle. Uh, the, all the uh, kind of the, the receiver and the metal components are retaining heat, making sure it's about 32, 32 degrees Celsius right now. But because this handguard is covering the, the, the top portions of the barrel, sure I can grab the rifle and not burn my hands, because this is like, I, you can't touch this right here. It's just too hot. Receiver's hot. But at least I can, I can grab the rifle and pass it on to somebody if I need to get over an obstacle or something like that, and they won't burn their hands. Plus, I mean, I can grab it, you know, and, and, and manipulate the rifle like this uh, with the bayonet effects without burning my hands. Having said that, it does retain the heat longer because it just can't dissipate heat as, eff as efficiently as the German variant. Um, also, uh, the action is more difficult to the action is more difficult to manipulate when you're when the rifle is loaded. It is more difficult to lift the bolt, cock on opening, just like any other kind of uh, 98 Mauser. It's cock on opening, and it is a struggle to lift that bolt and sometimes to eject, to eject that round in comparison to the K98, uh, which, which ha also has a much smoother action. The, the milling on this is really, it's really not good. However, um, somebody from Serbia told me, and uh, there's probably some truth to this, is that when uh, this is an earlier, this is an early M48 serial number is relatively low, um, 7932, and and um, he said they essentially had conscripts in the factory in Krajegivik, I think it is the name of the factory, um, and they were basically trainees. Uh, and maybe the quality standards weren't quite as good as the later models, like the Bezos Nasky uh, variants, which had no uh, roll script on the receivers, as they were built for uh, for um, export, mind you. But they were some of the later rifles, and they 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 appear to be of a higher quality, so far as finishing and, and polishing of the rifle is concerned. So difficult to lift the bolt um, had. Had some failures to to load. Um, rounds were binding up on the feed ramp on the inside here, using a clip to reload. I didn't have any of those problems with the K98. Maybe that's one of the downfalls of the uh, the intermediate length action. The action screws are closer together than they are on the standard 98, which is a regular length 98 Mauser. This is an intermediate, so it's a shorter action. 
And so um, be interesting just to kind of measure uh, how much opening area I have, com you know, compared to your, the standard 98. I didn't have any of those problems with, with the K98K, but I did with the M48. I even had to remove the bottom plate and, and start from scratch because I had a, they're all just banged up in there. Um, I, there's a lot more meat, especially in the wrist of this rifle. And I, I like that actually more than a thinner grip. I like the fat, the fat beefy grip on the, uh, on the M48. I like that a lot. Yeah. And other than that, you know, even though I have polished the, the internals on this, on this rifle, um, it still is more difficult to run. It's, it's, uh, it's the trigger is nowhere near. It's very, very, very strong trigger. We're probably in the eight, nine pound range on this rifle. Uh, with it, whereas the K98 is just so much smoother and so much lighter. However, it's also way more broken in. The finish is, you know, largely worn off in many areas. Who knows what, uh, what manufacturer of German Mauser it is? I mean, they're all parts rifles. All the, essentially, all of those K98 rifles that were, you know, were German made. Um, they were reassembled, you know, probably several times by the Yugoslavians and reissued and then refurbed and reissued and new barrels and new parts from any other kind of rifle. Just, just get them back together, get it back in service, out you go. And so essentially all parts rifles, all the original manufacturing markings have been removed and the Yugoslavian roll script, roll script applied. Um, so all of the, uh, all of, but with the M48, all of the parts are, are matching, all the numbers are matching. And, well, this is kind of interesting. Just, uh, again, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, downplay the, the Yugoslavians here, but uh, just kind of the, the quality of the finishing on this grip here. Um, I'm not quite sure what kind of wood that is, but it certainly is beautiful. That is not elm, I don't think. I'm not quite sure what the species is, but, uh, you know, it's, it's an oversized grip. Um, grinding marks on, but, you know, it's completely functional and dull, really, really dull. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I haven't made a video in a lot, last little while, so... Uh, you know, it's, it's high time that I did something and, and edited it, put it up on YouTube. Uh, a lot has happened since the last time I uh, uh, made a video for YouTube and Rumble, but, uh, you know, a lot of censorship that's been going on, Facebook and Instagram, YouTube, Rumble, not so much, but uh, uh, hopefully this gets out there and some of you actually get to see it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers, and as always, Maple Leaf Up.